Chapter 17 The gutless mansion was even large by the standards of mansions. Two houses wide and three stories high with a dormered roof and a private garden that played at the rear. Wilmer had said there'd be open windows. Almost everywhere, Wilmer had said. Apparently, Gutless indulged in a single nightly after-dinner cigar, an expensive Havana that smelled pretty nifty and passingly mellow, or so Wilmer had said. But the Gutless butler, a Brit named Kent, liked to open the windows as wide as he could, and in every weather, at every chance. Afraid of the odor, but not of the drafts, which had murdered the house plants, the tropical fish, and, according to Wilmer, the two gutless wives. One man's mead is another man's poison. The open windows, I counted seven gigantic casements, were joy to our hearts. Which one do you want? Buster said as we stood there. Buster insisted on coming along, and I didn't object to it. Buster himself had a nice, steady manner, a confident way that inspired my confidence. None of them yet. I examined the garden, its soggy bushes and scraggly ivy and bareheaded trees, one of which climbed towards an open window. I jerked at the window. That one, I said. Buster looked dubious. Second story? A likelier place to have private rooms. Like the kind of room where you might keep a kitten? Or anything else meant for private eyes? He shrugged and then followed me. Up to the branches, out on a limb, and then into the house. The very rich, someone famously offered, are very different from you and me, and the room that we entered was very different. The first impression was total gloom. The walls were dark and mahogany-paneled. The several windows had wine-colored drapes. On the left-hand panel, a sputtering fire was alive in a fireplace, lighting the rug that was laid out in front of it, fleshless and flat as a crime scene outline of somebody's corpse. The rug was a tiger, all right, or had been. Its glowing pelt had a pattern of stripes, and whoever had skinned it had very carefully kept it together and left it its head. Wilmer was right, though. It didn't have teeth. Its mouth was agape in a toothless snarl, and its glittering eyes had an absence of soul. We stood for a moment, stopped in our tracks at the awesome horror of what had been done. That such a creature, a big brother, had given his life to wind up as a rug, seemed as sorry a story as ever got told. And we stood there in silence, in deep contemplation of life and its meaning or lack thereof. Of course, he'd have eaten us, Buster said softly. I mean, if he'd seen us. I nodded. I know. It's the part about nature I've never liked, that creatures were made to destroy other creatures, and man was a creature like everyone else, a born hunter. The only difference, it seemed, was that mankind would do it for rugs. But what kind of difference was that to the prey? It would not have appeased me, I figured, to know that I had died for the greater nutrition of tigers, or even to wind up as mulch for a plant. So why did the notion of subbing for nylon appear to be harsher and more of a waste? I lifted my eyes as though looking for guidance, and that's when I saw what he had on the walls. Heads of animals, mostly cats. I spotted a leopard, a lynx, a jaguar, and another tiger. I started to reel. An entire jungle was here in Manhattan. Endangered creatures who'd once had a life and a chance at a future were nailed to the wall, and I felt revulsion and waves of pity. 
pity for all of us, doomed by nature to live by the tooth, the claw, and the gun. But the scene that surrounded me went beyond nature. That was the difference, and that was the twist. Nature kills, but she doesn't murder. And this was murder. It's not only cats, Buster said in a whisper. His blue eyes misted and circled the room. Over the mantel, suspended by chains, was the tusk of an elephant. Down on the floor was a tortoise-foot stool with tortoise feet. And up on the couch was an antelope afghan the size of a blanket. Buster said, Jeez, I mean, what would you call this? A zoo of the dead? I nodded grimly. I'd call it quits if it weren't for Louie. Come on, let's go. Let's look for the kitten and try to get out. Should we look on the floor? Buster said. Or the ceiling? Don't even think it, I said. Let's go. We moved very softly out to a hallway with woolen carpets and polished floors and a series of archways and half-open doors. So how are we doing this? Buster whispered. You want to split up or you want to stay? Shh. We were both silent and angled our ears. From somewhere below us, the sound of footsteps. The squeak of wingtips on carpeted stairs. We raced down the hallway and into a room that looked perfectly normal. Sofas and chairs, none of them mammals, present or past, and some non-amphibian tables and stools. From behind a doorway within the room came the whisper of breathing and odors of smoke. The squeaks pursued us. We dashed to the couch and then ducked underneath it in back of its skirt as the squeaky wingtips came into the room. Squeaks on the carpet. Knocks on the door. The voice behind it said, Now what, Kent? You're aware that I'm working? The voice was fat. It was partly rumble and partly purr, that fleshy sound that comes out of a throat that's been thoroughly buttered and clotted with cream. The voice in front of it dithered Britishly. Mr. Hench has arrived, Mr. G. Mr. Hench is early by half an hour. Should I keep him waiting? The clotted voice seemed to toy with a thought, like a dog with a bone. Whatever you say, sir, whatever you say. He could sit on the sofa and stare at his toes and get terribly angry. They usually do. And would that be amusing? Indeed, Mr. G. It would not be amusing, the fat voice rumbled. So open the door, man, and send him on in. Clickety-creak as the door opened. Squeak-squeak as the butler went out. We lay very still in our silk-lined bunker, not even breathing or twitching our ears. Something was under me poking my gut, and I squirmed to get rid of it. Kicked it away. What it turned out to be was a leaky ballpoint. A dime store pen in a millionaire's house. I thought it was funny. I didn't laugh. I kept not laughing as squeaky wingtips returned to the hallway and said, Go in. I couldn't resist it. I poked my head out and netted a vision of tasseled loafers, designer khakis, and Herman Hench, the blonde Peter Patter I'd seen at the Pearl. I pulled my head in and winked at Buster. Casper Gutless said, well and well. The door closed quietly. Herman Hench said, You wanted to see me. His voice was sharp with the spin of an accent, 
German, I thought. When a man kills a tiger but loses a kitten, he has to be seen, sir, to be believed. The fat voice chuckled but wasn't amused. I wanted to watch as you made your excuses. I ran into trouble, said Hench. From the start. Trouble indeed, sir, trouble indeed. I gave you complete and specific instructions. I drew you a map of the Beaumont farm. And you sat in that chair, sir, that very chair, on Friday at tea-time, and said, It's a deal. And you took my money, sir, quite a good bit. And I since learned the kitten's worth many times more. So you're holding out on me. Sound of a lighter clicking a flame on. Buster looked up. We listened intently as Hench said, Perhaps. Aha! Very good, sir. Ha! Very good. When you called me this morning and said he was gone after saying last night that you had him in hand, I was mighty suspicious, sir. Mighty upset. So now it's the story. You have him or not? Are you willing to equal the Beaumont's reward? The fifty thousand? The fat man laughed. <laughs> but upon delivery, sir, make it tonight. Better make it tomorrow. I'll need some more time. I see. Very well, sir. Then this is the deal. I'll see you on Monday at 9 p.m. You'll deliver the goods or return my deposit. I'll have your word on it. Yes. All right. And I'm certain you'll honor it. After all, we've been doing business for so many years. Now, where can I reach you? Et, please write it down. A moment of silence. Then, ah, I see. If you're heading there now, you can buy me a taxi. I have an appointment. The scraping of chairs. The click and the creak as the door popped open. I poked my head out, recording a glimpse of a man as obese as a man can be and still remain mobile. The view from the side was like watching the shape of the letter D with some feet at the bottom, an arm at the side, and a round O head like a mushy melon with whipped cream ringlets of dead white hair. Hench followed after him. I watched their retreat. Sound of their footsteps, hushed by the carpet, and Caspar Gutless bellowing, Kent, I shall need my overcoat. Then silence. We waited, motionless. After a time, Buster said quietly, Let's hit the road. And that's when I uttered the idiot words that were almost my last ones. No, I said. Wait. Cover my tail while I look in the office. I just want to see Mr. Hench's address. <laughs>